So imagine you're in a five-star hotel, standing in front of an all-you-can-eat buffet. You can smell the good food. It's full of delicious-looking dishes. And you can feast your eyes with all the desserts. And they're all the beverages you want. And to top it all, you're extremely hungry, meaning your body is ready to absorb all this excellent food. And right now, you'd say you're in heaven, wouldn't you? But what if the hotel manager actually jumped in, screaming at you, you have to swallow every single dish on that buffet. Every dish you'll be leaving will be accounted for on your bill. And if you leave too much, you're going to be escorted out of the hotel in humiliation. Besides, you just have one hour to do so. Somebody did it before you, so we know it's possible. And the hotel manager stands here in front of you, watching you, checking his watch. And right now, you'd be in hell, wouldn't you? Now, you might be thinking that this situation has never happened to you. And you'd be wrong. This situation is actually made compulsory in every industrialized country in the world for a period of at least 10 years. And this situation is called education. And this is where my story begins. If we can turn a gorgeous buffet into the most disgusting experience of your life, can't we go the other way around? Can't we indeed go from hell to heaven in education? My story is a comedy. It means it ends well, but it's epic. And to be epic, it has to begin in hell. And by hell, I mean real pain, massive torment. For you see, every decade in Japan, you've got more than 275,000 people committing suicide. Every decade, that's a city proper the size of Strasbourg. And in China, that's going to be 2,800,000. And that's a city proper the size of Paris. Now, I'm not saying that education is all responsible for that. All I am saying is that if uh, Suicide Incorporated were a publicly traded company, education would be an important shareholder and a board member. Now, when every decade in the world You've got more than 10 million people altogether committing suicide, deciding to leave this world. And that's a city proper the size of Seoul. They are sending the desperate message that society is not fit for them. But you see, education is supposed to prepare us to society. So the more painful and violent and frustrating education will be, the more painful, violent and frustrating society will be. Yet society and education, they're our constructs. We created them. Yet very often, we create things to serve ourselves, and we end up serving them instead. That's an important part of my story. Now, as a neuroscientist, I have a theory about suicide, which I sum up in the sentence, self explodes. Self stands for negative self-image. Nobody can commit suicide without a negative self-image. Yet, school very often gives us a rather negative than a positive self-image. Explore stands for exploration. It's a critical ability of the mind that's needed for creativity. Yet school being unable to teach it and to rate it and to grade it ends up suppressing it. This DES stands for desocialization. Now, it turns out that school is actually making us group illiterate. For school teaches us that strengths and success and excellence are graded individually while the whole history of mankind proves otherwise, from hunting mammoths to building the pyramids to dropping paratroopers over Holland, success or failure have always been collective processes. And the fact that we forgot this has something to do with our global inability to tackle global problems such as pollution, which is a collective failure. Now that school teaches us all three of the self-explodes has something to do with why we teach. So indeed, why do we educate? You know, what's the purpose of education? Do we educate for gross national happiness? Well, we know we don't. We educate for gross national product. And if we were educating for gross national happiness, there would be no grades. You know, grades are here to allow for an external judgment, to allow for people to rate your quality or lack thereof. But nobody would rate his personal happiness. And that's why actually Plato and Socrates and Buddha and Da Vinci, they loudly laughed at greats. Yet we have trapped ourselves into a civilization of greats. You know, we are so conditioned to reacting to labels rather than to the substance of things that we, today 
we could just take a bottle of soda and label it as Bordeaux wine, and there would be enough people to buy it as such. But you see, grades are like a framework we're imposing on reality. Honestly, this is what we're doing with grades. They're narrowing reality down. And once you realize that, once you realize they're just a framework, well, you can take them away and you see reality as it is in all its diversity and richness. And believe me, this is a very liberating experience. And it has to do with the way we go from hell to heaven in education. So why do we teach? For the industry, for the economy, and thus, how do we teach? Industrially, namely, like this. This is the way we teach, for is feeding. The appetite of students doesn't matter. What matters is that a given program be actually injected to their mind forcedly. Now, this is the very bottom of hell, and this is what we have to change. And it doesn't take a neuroscientist to know that when you're force-feeding your belly, when you're force-feeding your stomach, you're hurting yourself. That's because your digestive system is extremely smart and it's sending you signals, which we call gut feelings. And the digestive system is so smart, we actually call it the second brain because it has the second largest concentration of nerve cells in our body, second only to the first brain, that is, the brain and the spine. Now, we must admit one, one thing. If school were actually force-feeding the second brain of your children for one single day, you'd be all scandalized. If you'd learned that school had been force-feeding your children one day, you'd be terminating school immediately. Now, how come what we don't accept for our second brain we accept for our first brain, not for one day, but for 1,800 days in a row? It makes no sense at all. Is it any surprising then that so many people end up being disgusted with knowledge? Is it any surprising then that such a piece of knowledge as tasty and spicy as mathematics ends up being disgusted by so many people? You know, mathematics are actually the fine spice of the mind. They're extremely tasty, but their taste is extremely peculiar as well. And some people like it at once, others need to develop a taste for it. Everybody can like it, but nobody should ever be made to swallow mathematics without developing an appetite. And indeed, when we force feeding geese, what do we obtain in return? Foie gras, right? Now, when we're force feeding the brain, what do you expect to obtain, honestly? But what's most ironic is that some of these brains will die, some of these brains will, will kill other people, but the fattest of all will actually become our leaders. The people governing us, the people making decisions for us, are the ones who have been selected through this process of intellectual force-feeding. Now, this is the very bottom of hell. Can you imagine the mismanagement it's provoking? And believe me, I'm French, I know one or two things about mismanagement. Now, enough of visiting hell. What we've been doing is that we've been trying to force the brain into a box. Our education is a box, and our brain is forced into it. But our brain is bigger than this box. That's all. And humanity has been forcing itself into boxes throughout its history. Like, we've been forcing our humanity into boxes. Now, there was a beautiful period in our history in which we understood this fact, that humanity tended to force itself into boxes. And this beautiful period was the Renaissance. And this is during the Renaissance that the magic formula I'm about to give you to go from hell to heaven in education was first elaborated. For you see, in the Renaissance, people were perfectly understanding that we were forcing ourselves into boxes. And people were coming up with magic formulas indeed, such as this one. This one was used by Leonardo da Vinci. We shouldn't force nature into our science. We should adapt our science to nature. So you really have to think about, of it as a spell. It's a magic spell. So we're still in hell right now. All right, let's imagine yourself in hell, trying to break free from hell. And there's a door, there are people at the door of hell, and they're asking you for the password. Here's the password. We shouldn't force our brain into school. The moment you say that to the people standing at the gates of hell, preventing you from going out, they open the door and you break free from hell. But you're not in heaven yet. So now let's imagine you've stepped out of hell and you're in front of heaven's doors. 
So like you're going on, knock, knock, who's there? Somebody who wants to step into heaven. Okay, what's the password? Here's the password. We should adapt our school to our brain. This is how we turn education into heaven. Believe me now, we're entering into a completely new dimension. This new dimension I call a new renaissance. This is really heaven in education. And now that we're in heaven, let's meet with the heroes, with the angels. I made you a selection of my five favorites. I call them the Fantastic Five. The first of them is Ken Robinson. Ken has the superpower to envision the fact that the education we call traditional has nothing to do with traditions. It's industrial, period. Traditionally, Socrates didn't teach like that. The second one is Simon Sinek, thanks to whom I can definitely say that what we teach is not the problem. The problem is why we teach. And how we teach is a direct consequence of why we teach. The third one is Gunther Pauli, and to me is a new Da Vinci. This guy is saying we shouldn't force nature to look like our economy. We should force our economy to resemble nature. And the moment we do that, we're going to reap tremendous profits and tackle pollution. The fourth one is Matthew Peterson. His superpower is that he can teach mathematics with no language and with video games. And the students he teaches to actually end up performing better at standardized tests. And it is not surprising to a brain scientist at all, because just like pleasure is the normal way of absorbing food, pleasure is the normal way of absorbing knowledge. Pain should never be the way of absorbing knowledge. Pain is not natural to absorb knowledge. And that's why actually mammals play to learn, because playing is learning. And hence is coming my fifth angel, Jane McGonigal. She can envision a world in which actually school will be more addictive and immersive than video games. Can you imagine that? A, a world in which you'll be asking your kids, please, come on, play video games. You've been going to school for too long. But the point is that it's extremely easy to imagine when you think about it. Because in the metaphor of the buffet, school has actually the largest selection of food to offer. So if you have developed an appetite, indeed, school has a better selection of food than even video games. So now that we've stepped into heaven, what's our contribution today? What are we bringing to this new heaven of education? Only one thing, brain ergonomics. All I'm telling you today is that our education is not ergonomic to our brain. And why should it be? It was developed way before we knew anything about the brain. So my core message here is that if this is our brain, this is what education stimulates at best. Now, what does it give us? If this is a physical problem, if this is an intellectual problem, education is teaching us to grab it this way. It's not working. It's exhausting us, and it's painful. The moment you realize your brain is like that, you can grab problems this way. You're going to be able to hold them for a much longer period. It's not going to hurt you, and actually, it's going to be more elegant. So this new renaissance I'm talking about is actually a new renaissance when you think about it. And believe me, we've learned absolutely nothing yet. So this is the end of my story. Thank you so much for having listened to it. And the next time you'll be standing in front of an all-you-can-eat buffet, I'm quite sure you'll be thinking twice. <laughs>